Tom Swift in the Caves of Ice by Victor Appleton Chapter 1. Eradicate in an Airship Well, Master Tom, am you going out in your flying machine again today? Yes, Rad, I think I will take a little flight. Perhaps I'll go over to Waterford and call on Mr. Damon. I haven't seen very much of him since we got back from our hunt for the diamond makers. Take a run clear over to Waterfield, eh, Master Tom? Yes, Rad. Now, if you will help me, I'll get out the butterfly and see what trim she's in for a speedy flight. Tom Swift, the young inventor, aided by Eradicate Sampson, the helper of the Swift household, walked over toward a small shed. A few minutes later, the two had rolled into view on its three bicycle wheels, a trim little monoplane, one of the speediest craft of the air that had ever skimmed along beneath the clouds. It was built to carry two and had a very powerful motor. I guess it will work all right, remarked the young inventor, for Tom Swift had not only built this monoplane himself, but was the originator of it, and the craft contained many new features. It sure do look all right, Master Tom. Look here, Rad, spoke the lad as a sudden idea came to him. You've never ridden in an airship, have you? No, Mess Tom, and I ain't going to neither. Why not? Why not? Cause as how it ain't healthy, that's why. But I go in them frequently, Eradicate, so does my father. You've seen us fly often enough to know that it's safe. Why, look at the number of times Mr. Taman and I have gone off on trips in this little butterfly. Don't we always come back safely? Yes, that's true. But there might come a time when you wouldn't come back. And then where'd Eradicate Samson be? I ask you that. Where'd I be, Mr. Tom? Why, you wouldn't be anywhere if you didn't go, of course. And Tom laughed. But I'd like to take you for a little spin in this machine, Rat. I want you to get used to them. Sometime I may need you to help me. Come now. Suppose you get up in this seat here, and I promise not to go too high until you get used to it. Come on, it will do you good. And think of what all your friends will say when they see you riding in an airship. That's right, Master Tom. They sure will be monstrous envious of Eradicate Samson. That's what they will. It was clear that the man was being persuaded somewhat against his will, though he had been engaged by Tom Swift and his father off and on for several years. Eradicate had never shown any desire to take a trip through the air in one of the several craft Tom owned for this purpose. Nor had he ever evinced a longing for a trip under the ocean in a submarine. And as for riding in Tom's speedy electric car, Eradicate would have soon sat down with thirteen at a table, or looked at the moon over the wrong shoulder. But now somehow there was a peculiar temptation to take his young employer at his word, Eradicate had seen many times the youthful inventor and his friends make trips in the monoplane, as well as in the big biplane and dirigible balloon combined, the Red Cloud. Tom and the others had always come back safely, though often they met with accidents which only the skill and daring of the aeronaut had brought to a safe conclusion. "'Well, are you coming, Red? asked Tom as he looked to see if the oil and gasoline tanks were filled and gave a preliminary twirl to the propeller. Now does you think it am perfectly safe, Mr. Tom? And the man looked nervously at the machine. Of course, Rat, otherwise I wouldn't invite you. But I won't take you far. I just wanted you to get used to it. And once you have made a flight, you'll want to make another. I don't know how I believe I will, Mr. Tom. But as long as you have asked me, and as you say, some of them proud stuck-up men's in Shopton will be tooken down a peg or two when they seize me, why, I will go with you, Mess Tom. I thought you would. Now, take your place in the little seat next to where I'm going to sit. I'll start the engine and jump in. Now, sit perfectly still, and whatever you do, don't jump out. The ground's pretty hard this morning. There was a frost last night. I know there was, Miss Tom. Nope, I won't jump. I, I, oh, golly, Miss Tom, I guess I don't want to go. Let me out. Eradicate, his heart growing fainter as the time of starting drew nearer, 
made as if he would leave the monoplane in which he had taken his seat. Sit still, yelled Tom. At that instant, he started the propeller. The motor roared like a salvo of guns, and streaks of fire could be seen shooting from one cylinder to the other until there was a perfect blast of explosions. The speed of the propeller increased as the motor warmed up. Tom ran to his seat and opened the gasoline throttle still more, advancing the spark slightly. The roar increased. The lad darted a look at Eradicate. The man's face was like chalk, and he was gripping the upright braces at his side as though his salvation depended on them. Steady now, spoke Tom, yelling to be heard above the racket. Here we go. The butterfly was moving slowly across the level stretch of ground, which Tom used for starting his airships. The propeller was now a blur of light. The explosions of the motor became a steady roar, the noise from one cylinder being merged into the blast from the others, so rapidly that it was a continuous racket. With a whiz, the monoplane shot across the ground. Then, with a quick motion, Tom tilted the lifting planes, and as gracefully as a bird, the little machine mounted upward on a slant until, coming to a level about two hundred feet above the earth, Tom sent it straight ahead over the roof of his house. "'How's this, Rad?' he cried. "'Isn't it great?' "'It, it, ear butter. It's, it's mighty ticklish, Miss Tom. That's the word. It sure am mighty ticklish.' Tom Swift laughed and increased the speed. The butterfly darted forward like some hummingbird about to launch itself upon a flower. And indeed, the revolutions of the propeller were not unlike the vibrations of the wings of that marvelous little creature. Now for some corkscrew twists, cried the young inventor. Here we go, Rad. With that, he began a series of intricate evolutions, making figures of eight spirals, curves, sudden dips, and long swings. It was masterwork in handling the monoplane, but eradicate Samson as he sat crouched in the seat, gripping the uprights until his hands ached was in no condition to appreciate it. Gradually, however, as he saw that the craft remained up in the air and showed no signs of falling, the fears of the man left him. He sat up straighter. "'Don't you like it, Rad?' cried Tom. This time the answer came with more decision. "'It sure am great, Miss Tom. I, I'm beginning to like it. Well, I guess I do like it. Now, if some of them stuck-up men could see me—' They think you were stuck up, eh, Rad? Stuck up in the air. That's right, Miss Tom. Ha <laughs> ha! I saw them stuck up in the air. <laughs> By this time, Tom had glided the machine away from the village, and they were flying over the field some distance from his house. The man was beginning to enjoy his experience very much. Suddenly, just as Tom was trying to get a bit more speed out of the motor, the machine stopped. The cessation of the racket was almost as startling as a loud explosion would have been. Just by luck, cried Tom. What's the matter? asked Eradicate anxiously. Motor stalled, replied the young inventor. Ah, oh, by golly, we've fallen, yelled the man. Naturally, with the stopping of the propeller, there was no further straightforward motion to the monoplane. And following the law of nature, it began to drop toward the earth on a slant. We've fallen, we'll be killed yelled the man. It's all right. I'll just fall plain back to earth, spoke Tom calmly. I've often done it before, higher up than this. Sit still, Rad. I'm fall planing back to the ground. And I'll jump back to the ground. That's what I'll do. I ain't going to wait until I fall. No, sir. And I ain't going to do no of that ball playing you'll speak of, Miss Swift. It's no time to play ball when your life am in danger. I ain't going to jump. Sit still, cried Tom, for the man was about to spring from his seat. There's no danger. I didn't say anything about playing ball. I said I'd fall playing back to earth. We'll be there shortly. I'll take you down safe. Sit still, Rad. He spoke so earnestly that the fears of his passenger were quelled. With a quick motion, Tom threw up the head planes to check the downward sweep. The butterfly shot forward on a gradual slant, repeating this maneuver several times. The young inventor finally brought his machine to within a short distance of Earth, and also considerably nearer his own home. I wonder if we can make it, he murmured, measuring the distance with his eye. I think so. I'll shoot her up a bit, and then let her down on a long slant. Then, with another upward tilt, I ought to fetch it. The monoplane tilted upward, Eradicate gave a cry of terror. 
It was stilled, and a look from Tom. Once more, the air machine glided forward. Then came another long dip, another upward glide, and the butterfly came gently to earth, almost on the very spot whence it had flown upward a few minutes before. Eradicate gave one mad spring from his seat almost before the bicycle wheels had ceased revolving as Tom jammed on the earth brake. Here, where are you going, Rad? cried the lad. Where am I going? I was going to see if my mule boomerang him safe. He's the only kind of an airship I wants after this. And the man disappeared into the shack, whence came a loud hee-haw. Oh, pshaw! Wait a minute, Rad. I'll soon have the motor fixed and we'll make another try. I'll take you over to Mr. Tamon's with me. No, sir, Mr. Tom, you don't catch this man in any more airships. My mule am good enough for me, shouted Eradicate from the safe harbor of the mule stable. Tom laughed and turned to inspect the motor. As he was looking it over to locate the trouble, the door of the house opened and a pleasant-faced woman stepped out. Oh, Tom, she called. I looked for you a moment ago and you weren't here. No, Miss Baggert, Tom replied, waving his hand in greeting to the housekeeper. Rad and I just came back quite suddenly. Sooner than we expected to. Why, did you want me? Here's a letter that came for you, she went on. Tom tore open the envelope and rapidly scanned the contents of the missive. Hello, he ejaculated half aloud. It's from me, Papa Crombie, that miner I met when we were after the diamond makers. He says he is on his way east to get ready to start on the quest for the Alaskan Valley of Gold in the Caves of Ice. I had almost forgotten that I had promised to make the attempt in the big airship. How did this letter come, Mrs. Baggert? he asked. By special delivery. The messenger brought it a few minutes ago. Then we may see Abe any day now. Guess I'd better be looking over the Red Cloud to see if it's in shape for a trip to the Arctic regions. Tom's attention for the moment was taken off his little monoplane and his memory went back to the strange scenes in which he and his friends had recently played a part in searching for the cave of the diamond makers on Phantom Mountain. He recalled the promise he had made to the old miner. I wonder if he expects us to start for Alaska with winter coming on, thought Tom. His musings were suddenly interrupted by the entrance into the yard surrounding the airplane shed of a lad about his own age. Hello, Ned Newton, called Tom hardly. Hello, yourself, responded Ned. I've got a day off from the bank, and I thought I'd come over and see you. Say, have you heard the latest? No. What is it? Andy Foger is building an airship. Andy Foger building an airship? Yes, he says it will beat yours. <laughs> it will, eh? Well, Andy can do as he pleases as long as he doesn't bother me. I won't be around here much longer anyhow. Why not, Tom? Because I soon expect to start for the far north on a strange quest. Come on into the shed, and I'll tell you about it. We're going to try to locate a valley of gold, and I guess Andy Foker won't follow me there, even if he does build an airship. Tom and his chum started toward the shed, the young inventor still holding the letter that was to play such an important part in his life within the next few months. And had he only known it, the building of Andy Foger's airship was destined to be fraught with much danger to our hero. End of chapter 1